that is your parenting style in a nutshell. You fall down. Yep. If there's no blood, get up. Get on with it. Pretty much. The show must go on. Yep. In life, you have to, like, put your big girl pants on and come to the party, you know? Like, if you fall down, you have to get up. Who's going to pick you up? Welcome to Seriously Catherine, a podcast about taking your business seriously, but not yourself. All right, so here are some hot takes around the movie industry. As you all know, if you've been listening for a while, you know that I'm obsessed with going to the movies. I go by myself. I go in the middle of the day. I just, I love going to the movies all by myself. I don't have to like compromise on the movie that I'm seeing. I don't have to share popcorn. I can get whatever I want to. I can get actual Coke instead of Diet Coke because that's so lame. So I'm really excited about seeing The Fall Guy with... Emily Blunt and Ryan Gosling. I'm just so excited about seeing this movie. It seems like he must have filmed it right around the time that he also filmed Barbie. I mean, somebody could fact check me here, but he's got like the little blonde tips. And I'm, I'm just thinking it's going to be a great movie. I mean, again, correct me if I'm wrong, but I'm pretty sure the director of this movie is a like stunt guy. So the whole movie is like dedicated to the crews and the stunt people and the security and the pyrotechnic artists that always are kind of like behind the scenes for some of these movies and so I'm really excited about seeing that can't wait can't take the kids I mean I guess I could it's PG-13 so the other movie that is coming out is Challengers with Zendaya I'm excited about that. I don't know the two guys that are in this movie like I don't even recognize them and who cares because like she's obviously the star of the movie and I'm excited about that because all the, sh the outfits that she's worn the press tour for this movie have been tennis related and it's just I'm just loving it. And people may not remember but she was Casey Undercover on the Disney Channel well before she was this you know red carpet starlet. Also I believe If is coming out. If is starring Ryan Reynolds and it's really gonna be good I think um there's tons of people who are in this movie like Steve Carell and now I can't remember anybody else but there's a whole litany of famous people who are the voices behind these imaginary friends it's kind of like if you ever saw Spirited with Will Ferrell and Ryan Re Reynolds it's kind of giving me like those kind of vibes I really can't wait for this is not until June but Inside Out 2. And that one is one that I literally just cannot wait for. Riley, like we, Riley's the little girl from Inside Out 1 and we just, we need a catch up with her. So that is my hot take on all the movies. I'm really excited. I love the movies. We are coming up on a very important, iconic day in the year and that is Mother's Day. So I thought it'd be fun to have my mom as a guest on this week's episode. She was in town last week or the week before that. And so we put her in the hot seat and we told her to tell us all the stories that may or may not have been triggering to me as her daughter. And maybe I think she I think she also did tell me some things that I should be doing with my children. Always some judgment, but with love from Margie Willis. She certainly has a different way of looking at parenthood, demonstrating parenthood, and I'm excited for you guys to finally like sort of maybe get a little window into who I am, how I am, and why I am. It has a lot to do with my mom. And so I'm excited for you guys to hear from her. She is a Lily Pulitzer loving fool. That's one thing that's awesome about her. She's also, I definitely get my Disney fanatics from her. She's just got this zest for going for it. I'm excited for y'all to meet her and let's get right into that episode. I think I think about my mom a lot while I'm being a mom. I think how I was raised has directly, like it directly correlates to how I am raising my kids and how I live my life every day. And so maybe this is triggering to you, but your mom and dad both died when you were a kid. Yes. Suddenly. Yes. And I feel strongly that 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 has impacted you and how you parent and how you live life. And 
I've talked about this a lot, how like you taught me, you know, like tomorrow is not promised and you don't know what what is going to come down the pike tomorrow. And so live every day like it is your last and also live life with no regret because you maybe you have some. Do you feel like you I mean, you tell me about your experience and how that has impacted you as a mom. So that and then I also want to talk about how lately when I, I have these three little girls now and it's like. I open my mouth and you come out, <laughs> you know, like, especially when like I'm in the bathroom. I can vividly remember being a child at the bathroom door while you were inside the bathroom and being like, mom, let me in. I need to talk to you right now. And you were like, let me pee in peace. <laughs> and I feel like I do that every day now. It's so it's so bizarre where it's like this this vivid, visceral memory that I had never remembered before, but now I'm on the other side of it. And you're, you just love that, right? <laughs> yes. <laughs> you're just like... Because I didn't have that before. Like like you said, my mom died when I was young. Dad died first, and then my mom died a month later in the same year. So I, I didn't have anybody to teach me how to be a mom. And like I tell you and your brother all the time, you didn't come with the owner's manual. <laughs> I just had to learn. I had to wing it. I didn't have anybody to follow me or tell me or explain to me how to do anything. Well, yes, you did. You had Sissy. Sissy's 10 years older than you. This is my mom's sister, who we all call Sissy. And she was certainly opinionated and telling you what she thought growing up. I mean, like while we were growing up, she was always around. Right. She she was opinionated. She is opinionated. (laughs) (laughs) Very much so. But it's still not like your mom. So I didn't feel like she was my sister. Yeah, well, and you are 10 years younger than Sissy. Yeah. So when you came along, and this is just like knowledge from from things, you know, Garrett and I were always told through the years, is like you were the spoiled little rotten brat. Yes, I was. Financially, <laughs> your parents were in a different position, you know, 10 years later. And so you had a different upbringing and a different lifestyle and a different almost like a different set of parents than, than sissy had and well it whatever my parents didn't give me my sister did so <laughs> i was a small brat yeah but my parents asked her if she wanted a baby or a tv and she says all the time she should have took the tv <laughs> <laughs> it would have been a lot easier <laughs> so like bring us back to like when that happened like Everything's going hunky dory. I mean, your parents seemed healthy and everything. Well, my and dad then... had a heart attack. He had complete heart failure three times. And they brought him back three times in the hospital. One night, I remember, like it was yesterday, walking into the hospital room, just getting off the phone with him, talking, walking into the hospital room, and the bed's gone, the sheets are gone, there's stuff thrown all over the room. It was like, okay, where is I just talked to him, like I hung up and walked into the hospital, and now where is he? You know, and he had had complete heart failure, and they brought him back to intensive care. That that was a strange feeling. I mean, yeah, that's like traumatic. <laughs> I was 14, 15, so they've been gone for a long time. They've been gone longer than I've lived with my husband. <laughs> Well, what does Sissy say? She says they've been gone longer than they were alive. Right. She was 48 and he was 52. Okay, so have you ever talked to Sissy about this? Like, like what happened next? Because, like, literally a month later, so he dies, and then a month later, she died. Right. She Your wa- mom. My mom had just gotten a check, my dad's last paycheck, from the city of New Orleans because he was a radiator mechanic at the city of New Orleans. And he had just gotten his last check, and it came payable to him. He was dead. So she had to have the check changed to her name so she could cash it or do whatever. So my sister had gone to the city hall, talked to her at 1030. She went on lunch. She worked downtown. She came back. She called her. She talked to her at 11, and they estimated her death at 1130. And then she couldn't, wouldn't answer the phone after that, and she didn't drive. My mom didn't drive at all. So somebody could have picked her up and took her to the store or whatever. She had friends. And so that's what my sister thought. And when she got home at 5 o'clock, she walked in, and she was dead sitting on the sofa. My dad's brother and his wife and two boys lived next door. And so she ran next door and got Gerald. And Jerry came through on the floor, started CPR, but she was dead. Oh, my God. The story was they estimated the death, her death at 1130 because she, she smoked. And she had sat on the sofa and the cushion, she had lit a cigarette. She obviously was vacuuming. The vacuum had fallen down and she lit a cigarette to go sit down because she got out of breath or whatever. And she lit a cigarette and she put it and she died. 
and it, on the cushion, it, the cushion burnt all the way through, but it was one long ash. And the whole idea of them buying that kitchen, that living room set was because the material was fire resistant. <laughs> And because my uncles and my grandfather were firemen, and that was big with my dad. That was fire resistant, so that's why it didn't burn. But this, the cushion, there's a whole, she still has the sofa because she's a pack rat. Sissy still has it? She's, she's a hoarder. That is so, <laughs> that is dark. The cushion has one long hole through the whole cushion. Did you ever talk about it? Like, so this is another, like, sort of, like, recurring theme, I think, in my life as well. You just, you just power through. You yeah. just, like, keep on going. Like, yeah. what, what's, the, what's the point of deep diving and talking about the feelings and what happened and history and it's the past? It's not going to change. <laughs> and it's, but, like, also, there is, there is, like, healing qualities. It's therapeutic to sort of talk about it and get through it. I mean, well, you don't think, like, harboring all that shit is, it ain't good. Well, you got to find your way. You got to find it in you. I personally don't think that you're going to go crazy on this, but a therapist helps. You don't think therapy helps? No. No, but like it's proven to help. But I don't believe it. Like the, the science how is can there. An, how can another person tell you how you feel or what's going to happen? That's not what therapy is. A good therapist First of all, it's it takes time to find one that like you vibe with and you get along with and like you know helps you. Well, couldn't you have a good friend? One good I friend. I mean, but like that would know everything about you and have you back. It's not about the therapist knowing things about you. It's about them facilitating you talking about what you went through and and navigating it yourself it's not like you're telling a therapist something and the therapist says oh margie you should do this you should that they never do that they're not supposed to like that's not the purpose the purpose of it is for them to support you while you personally navigate through it out loud can't you do that on your own are you doing it on your own i've done it <laughs> I, mean, I mean, I think I'm successful. I taught for 43 years. I raised two kids that are somewhat normal. I know. like so. You, but those are not core. Like, like being a good teacher doesn't mean that you are that you have no struggle or challenge with your mental health. Like, yes, you have been a great mom. You're an awesome parent. You're a great partner to dad. You have a successful career in an education. Right. All of those things are true. That doesn't mean that you don't struggle mentally with trauma that you experienced in your life. I struggle with stuff, but it's you have to. I just think you have to figure it out for yourself. I disagree. <laughs> I feel like had had I known earlier that I could get the support that I have now, I feel like I would be much further along and, and like would have had it figured out sooner, which is really cool. You don't have to go through it on your own. Like you don't have to like white knuckle it and just like power through. It's actually more fun to do that like healing get it like I don't know what I'm trying to say get through things challenges and do it in a group setting or with people who I mean that's that's why I am as transparent as I am I think in life because it's just I'm I feel more supported when people know what's going on and what what I've gone through what I've overcome things that I'm challenged with right don't you don't you agree you don't agree. No. You're just like a keep all your shit hidden, quiet, period. No one needs to see your dirty, hear your dirty laundry. Well, I just think you need to. I, I have two good friends that I can talk to, that I relate to, that I tell things to, that I don't tell everybody else to. Yeah, and that's enough. Yeah. I guess to each his own. Okay, let's let's switch gears here. Like when your parents died, you've said this in the past where it's like once once mama and daddy were dead, like everybody sort of disappeared. Yes. And they disappeared from your life. They didn't well, stick around to like support you, to help sissy raise you, to like navigate all of that. That's fucked up. Well, I think that had a lot to do with my sister and the way she is. Oh, do you think she's a control freak and she didn't yeah. want anybody's help? Well, she she doesn't. Look at her now. I know, but you're saying the same thing, Mom. You're saying, like, I don't need any but help. No, I'm good. I do. I, I get help from my friends, not... You're lucky to have friends. Like, you're lucky to have people who care about you and who you feel comfortable sharing and being vulnerable with. Not everybody does. So right. they go to therapy. Right. And it... 
And if that's great for you, that's great for you. But every I, everybody has to have their own way and their own thing. Okay. I mean, I guess agree to disagree. <laughs> okay. Let's switch gears to your parenting style. Have you ever heard this, like, this this sort of thing where it's like, where I guess I can just tell the story how like Garrett, my brother played a lot of sports. And so we were always in the bleachers, like cheering him on or whatever. And I just have this vis- vivid memory of Garrett, like sliding into second and like not getting up and you standing up and be like, get up, get up. You're not bleeding. Get up. Continue. You know? So like that is your parenting style in a nutshell. Like you fall down. If there's no blood, get up, get on with it. Pretty much. The show must go on. Yep. You don't want to dig in deeper there? Well, I just think in, <laughs> in life, you have to, like, put your big girl pants on and come to the party, you know? Like, if you fall down, you have to get up. Who's going to pick you up? Well, I mean, that's my point, though. You didn't have anyone to pick you up, so you learned how to cope and you learned how to deal with it So on that, your own. that was it's my like, parenting skills because that's all I knew. Yeah, your parenting skills are like survival of the fittest. That, <laughs> <laughs> pretty much. When y'all were aggravating each other on in the back of the car and I put you out on the interstate and made you walk home, yeah, you got home. We talk about this a lot. I think how just like p- parenting is different, motherhood is different. The times have changed. You can't you can't leave your kid in the grocery in the grocery store. You mm-hmm. can't like leave the grocery store without your child, or you can't leave your kid in the car to run into the gas station. Well, it's, it's back in the day we left Garrett at the ballpark. Well, you left Garrett at the ballpark. You also left Garrett at home, or Dad left Garrett at home when he was like five. Yeah. yeah. And, and so tell this story because it didn't it didn't really. I mean, it ended fine, but it was a little. Yeah, we could have went to jail. <laughs> <laughs> well, you have to set up the scene. Like, we lived okay. in a neighborhood where we knew all the neighbors. And, like, even when I was, like, Zia's age, four or five years old, I would run away. And I would run away to Shelly's house, who was, like, the the young couple, Shelly and Gary. They didn't have kids yet. And they lived, like, three or four houses down, like, a block away. And I would be like, I'm running away. And I would pack a bag. And I would haul, I would, I would take it down the road. And, and like, that evening, right, like, Shelly would call my mom and be like, hey, Katie's over here. She ran away again. And But Shelly would give me pedicures. And she would just, like, spend quality time with me. And I, I got whatever I wanted. I felt, like, seen. And then they had a baby. And I think that, that that sort of stopped. And yeah, I didn't run away there anymore. I was I was replaced. Your uncles lived on behind us and next to us and all around us and it was just like a family combo. Yeah, she she's justifying her decision here. I went to the grocery store with you and my husband was supposed to be babysitting Garrett. Dads don't babysit. They're the parent. Okay, well, whatever. Your father had your brother, okay? And he was supposed to be watching him, which I say babysit because it wasn't a very good babysitter, okay? (laughs) And he was five. My husband builds houses, and he built, like, down the block, okay, like a couple of miles away. And somebody called him and said that he wanted to go into the house or whatever. So he locked all the doors with the deadbolts, and he went to the job site. And he was only supposed to be there for five five or ten minutes, but my husband doesn't know how to tell time very well. And he was gone for at least 30, 40 minutes, maybe an hour. The phone rang because we had a landline and woke him up. So well, so Garrett was home by himself. And he was like napping or something? Yeah, he was sleeping. And the phone rang and woke him up. It startled him. He went looking for his daddy. His daddy wasn't there. So he decided he was hungry. So I had taught him how to heat up microwave the hot dogs. So we always had hot dogs in the fridge for him. He put a hot dog on a plate, on a saucer, put it in a microwave. But instead of for 20 seconds, he did it for two minutes. Then the hot dog exploded and he went to grab the plate and it was hot and he dropped it. Well, then he got upset because he dropped my plate and it broke. And he he thought he was going to be in trouble because he broke my plate. So he went to get out of the house and the doors were all dead bolted. Because if you turn the knobs, you can just open the door. Well, they were all dead bolted. And he didn't know how to unlock the dead bolt. So he went into the garage and he got a shovel, pushed the shovel underneath the garage door, the handle, and lifted it up. Well, he broke the handle of the shovel so then he was frustrated from that so now he's crying he's upset he doesn't know what to do he takes a hammer and he climbs on the dryer which was under a window and he broke the window panes well the screen is on the window 
So he broke the window and the screen was there. Well, he didn't think to push the screen out and he could have gotten out. The hammer went out the window. So now he doesn't have the hammer. So now he's really in a panic. So he goes and he's thinking, how can I get out? So he goes and he gets his baseball bat because he played baseball on an eight-year-old team when he was four. He swung at my back sliding glass door, my double insulated sliding glass door, and he broke the sliding glass door. Barefoot, walked over the gl glass, climbed the fence, and went to the next block to a friend's house, to another friend of ours, which my husband built their house, and he knocked on the door. Well, he was hysterically crying. He was all red, dirty, a mess. His feet are bleeding. If anybody would have seen him walking down the street or climbing the fence in two blocks, we would have gone to jail because he looked like a battered child. And she opened the door, and she was like, what happened? And he, he's crying. He's telling her he... he his daddy's gone, he broke the plate, he, he broke the sliding glass door, he's bleeding, his feet hurt because he's got glass all in it. And so she brought him in, she calmed him down, she cleaned him up, she picked out glass out of his feet as much as she could, and then she called my husband, who at that time had a cell phone. That was one of the first big cell phones. He had like a bag phone. He had a big, old, a big old bag thing. And so he, she called him, and he was like, I'm right around the corner, I'll, I'll be there. So he came right, right, um, like two minutes away, came home, and then we got home from the grocery store, and there was glass everywhere from the glass side, glass store, the hot dog, the mustard, the ketchup <laughs> it, 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 my house was a mess and I was like well, what happened <laughs> I was gone for an hour I had to go find my son at my girlfriend Sharon's house and you know everything was fine we picked glass out of his feet for days but you know so then my husband never did babysit again consequently okay so let's talk about that <laughs> I guess like different kids different personalities like how do you how do, do you feel you parented us the same do you think you parented us differently I parented y'all both the same. Your daddy didn't parent both the same. You were his princess. Daddy's little girl. He carried you in the hospital on a pillow. <laughs> she was so little, and he was afraid he was going to drop her, so he, she, he carried her around on a pillow. Garrett was definitely a mama's boy. Yeah, he was a mama's boy. You all got along better. Yeah, because he listened. He didn't fight. I poked the bear. <laughs> oh, yeah. All the time. I'm a disruptor. Yes, it's it served me well in, in life. And so am I. You are so much like me. It's scary. You don't think I'm a lot like dad, too? No. I feel like I'm a mixture. No. I have none of dad's qualities. The only thing I got was his greasy hair. <laughs> well, I guess you, you're compassionate. You know, he's he's got somewhat compassionate. He's more business sense than I am. I mean, he's ambitious. He's yeah. unapologetically himself. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Stubborn. He's a mix between Red Sanford and Archie Bunker. I think I've gotten skepticism from him. Yeah. He's very skeptical. He's very, what is that other word? I don't know. He just, like, questions everything. He wants to know why, why, why. He's great in crisis. Man, like, during, after Hurricane Katrina, I, I mean, I, he talked a lot about his experience as a child with Hurricane Betsy and how Papa and Mama, like, took in all the people and, you know, they had family members, not just their kids, but their siblings and their family that they needed to take care of. And, like, everyone showed up at their house and they did the thing. And so I feel like during Katrina, I saw evidence that that impacted him. He was, like, this this beacon but everyone came to s sort of like get their marching orders from him and like he was like home base I mean I mean our house ended up being home base for a lot of people I don't know and I do think I get this from him like he doesn't take appreciation well how do you think he accepts appreciation not at all very 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 seldom does he's he. just like he's just like this is life this right. is well the both of y'all are like that where it's yeah. like you don't really talk about your feeling no it's just sort of like carry on you just have to tie your shoes and get to work. Because if you don't do it, not, when's it going to get done? Who's going to do it? And well, they won't do it like, as well as you think you can do it. Well, yeah, that's another thing he <laughs> always says. Like, if I don't do it, it doesn't get done. I don't, I don't believe that, though. I feel like I've dispelled that myth in my life. Like, I've figured out what my best use of time is, and I only want to do that. And everything else, somebody else can do. I'm never going to be a podcast producer like that's not my that's not my best use of time that's not my g zone of genius is like is that what they say these days I like to delegate I don't believe that I am the end-all be-all like other people 
are capable of doing things better than me. There's a million other ways of doing something and still getting the result that is acceptable. But as a parent, I always felt like the house, the kids... The clothes, the groceries, the homework, all that was me. And he he went to work, and that's what he did. And I totally spoiled him, too, as a, as a wife, because I'd work full days, come home, cook dinner, serve him, take his plate, wash it, the whole bit. I did, I did it all. He did nothing but go to work and come home. And then when I had kids, I had two more mouths to feed and four more batches of clothes to do. And, you know, now that I'm— Basically retired, well, I did go back to work, but basically retired after 43 years. He's now cooking. He now does his own laundry because I don't wear them because <laughs> he told me once that I, I didn't do his laundry right. And um, I was like, okay, I don't wear them, so start washing. He ran out of clothes one day, and he said, when are you going to wash clothes? I said, I'm not. You wear them, you wash them. So now he washes his own clothes. Like, uh, that's another thing that's just, like, different now. Like, I don't remember dad I well okay if we wanted to see him we had to go to the job site right. we had to go if we wanted to go to lunch with him or wanted to go hang out with him whatever it's like we would have to go and like drag him off the project to go hang out and he wasn't at many baseball games like it was a big deal if he was at a if, if he was at one of Garrett's baseball games right and it wasn't really until like maybe high school college like he got he definitely got more interested in in sports when like Ryan was playing football for LSU and they went to, like, we that was like a big family affair we would all just travel around the football games but if we it was a big deal if he was at an extracurricular activity because he was working he right. worked his ass off he worked from sun up to sundown every day seven days a week big would you have expected this of me mom well I would expect nothing less oh but my God that's yes but but as a child as bringing you up and bring Garrett up in the, in the South, okay, in down in Louisiana, in New Orleans, that you did whatever your mom did. You know, you, you just followed suit. You you didn't think out of the box ever. Okay, so so what you're saying is like being raised in the South as a woman, you felt like I would probably just become a school teacher, yeah, like you. Yeah, just follow suit, like something in business, something in the area of business, not New York City. You always had big dreams. You always thought bigger than what the people down south think. So I have exceeded your expectations, when, what you're saying. When you went from Lake Castle, which was a little small, itty-bitty school compared to other public schools, and you were going into Mount Carmel, which was like 2,000 kids, okay? Well, it was going from like a class of 80 to a class of 250 kids. Right. And going from like a safe sort of familiar small family. pond and and we knew all the parents we knew all the families it was it was secure and comfortable going to mount carmel which was an all girls this was like this is me going to another all girls school i had a horrible experience with the all girls school in third fourth and fifth grade i was hysterical every day i hated it that's why you moved me to lake castle which was a better experience and now i'm going back into this all girls culture and y'all were like a little worried very worried the first week of school she comes home and says I'm running for freshman class president I was like Katie really <laughs> freshman class president you just went from you know from this small school to this big who why why would you put yourself out there just remember if it does and she was like dead set I'm doing it I don't care I'm doing it I was like okay but be ready for your answer if you don't get it, it's just an experience. It's not life threatening or I was just I was scared to death, okay, because I don't put myself out there unless I know I'm gonna succeed. Period. So she ran for freshman class president. She went to school the day of the election and she calls me and she says, I'm not riding home with April to come home. I was like, Why? What happened? And she says, Oh, well, I have to go to Sister Camille Ann's office. I was like, and that was the principal, the headmaster of the school I said what did you do Katie <laughs> and she goes well I kind of won freshman class president so I'm not going to be home so I was like you did what <laughs> I was 
totally surprised. And she did. She, you know, and that right then I knew that the sky could be the limit for, her, you know, but she's, her dad is definitely Eeyore. He is definitely an Eeyore. You know, the son's not going to come up today. So I told, I told him, I said, Katie's not coming home. You know, she went to Camille Ann's office. He said, oh, she got kicked out already? I was like, no, she made freshman class president. He was like, so what does that mean? Like, she's got more things to do? You know, it's always the negative side, not the positive side. And then, but right now with Pallet, with the things that she's done up here in New York, in Saratoga, people see, like, his friends that he graduated from high school with, that we're still friends with, that we still talk to. They'll say, oh, well, I saw Katie on this. I, I saw Katie on that. I saw, on you know, and, and he's like, how do you know more about my daughter than I do? <laughs> because he's not allowed on Facebook. <laughs> So wait, I wanted to talk about like, do you think do you think you and Dad just wish I was closer? Yes, and I think that, like that's a lot of it. Where yes. it's like he can't really endorse my success or my independence or my doing you know doing he, well where I am because it's not in his face near him. Yeah. yeah, he doesn't see it every day. Yeah, like what is it that you did to make me who I am? I mean, I think like. Your parenting style and my upbringing has had an impact on how I show up in the world. So what is that? And how did you do that? I, tell, I think, tell everyone how to do it. I think the business side of it came from your daddy because I'm not a business person. I'm not a money person. I'm like, if I got $50 on me, I'm spending it. You know? <laughs> <laughs> I'll get more tomorrow and I'll rob Peter to pay Paul and I'm good. You know, as long as I get what I want or they get what they, I want them to have. But um, the business sense definitely came from your father. I know, but where did the, the fearlessness or the, the take a chance, take a risk, bet on yourself, well, that, where that That's me. From? That's me. I had a bet on myself. I had nobody. I fell back on Sissy. But then once I got married, things kind of went south with that support. Not really, Mom. I mean, Sissy was very engaged and involved in our in, in our childhood, in, in, I mean, we were there. The like, kids, yeah. yeah she, I mean, she was the only babysitter I had, or she would only come over. And She's the only family I have, basically. And all my aunts and uncles have passed away. And, and they disappeared after your parents died. They were like, peace out. We don't want to raise this kid. Basically. And it fell on Sissy. I'm sure there's, like, a lot of, like, natural resentment with, like, I don't know. She was, like, what, 24 years old at the time? And now she's got to, she's got to like, be responsible for this kid. She was always responsible, basically for me yeah i know but like sissy i mean i think that she gave up a lot like just because she had i mean i guess she didn't have to she could have disappeared too and she could have been like yeah be what is it called like um what is it not emancipated like no i'm just saying she didn't have to do any of that she could have just been like yeah she she could have followed suit with with all the family around her and said like yeah you're on your own kid I agree. And you're on and your own kid, you always have been, sort of thing, right? And uh, she didn't. She stepped she stepped, she stepped up. up. She she and also helped you raise us. Right. right I mean, she was definitely right. like a solid fixture in our childhood. Right. Because that was the only family I had. So why don't you give us some parenting tips? Be there listen to your children, be there for them. And remember that I the way I looked at it was you were imp- the most important thing in my life. And that's what I'm having the most trouble with right now because I did devote everything to them. Garrett's married and his having his family and you have your family and it's like, okay, we have nobody. <laughs> you know, like all that time I I invested in them, they're doing their own thing. They don't see that I'm not going to be here much longer. Let, let's be realistic. My parents died when I was 48 and 52. I'm 68. I, I could be gone tomorrow at this rate. Do you feel like you're like living on borrowed time? Yes. And I think the older you get, the more you feel that way because you're on the downhill. You're not on the uphill. On the uphill, it's such a fight. You know, you got so many things going on and so many irons in the fire and trying to survive now you you're going down you're on the way out and the ones that are going up don't see that the ones going down need you more i don't know if i'm saying it right but yeah i think you're saying it right like yeah you you work so hard throughout your whole life and for others and then it's not always reciprocated right and i do feel like if i lived home it would be different right 
And I'm such a connector and a bringer together of people. So I do think that there would be more opportunities to spend time together and be around each other. But I'm not there. Right. And it's the best thing for you, believe it or not, I'm saying this, to be here and not there because there's really nothing there for you. There is stuff there for me, but I sure as hell would not have seen the sense of success and independence that I needed to experience for myself if I didn't move away. Right. And I think that I felt that even growing up, like I just felt like, wow, we were always just the Willises. We were always like the Willises, the Willises. It was all about the Willises. And I was like, well, what about me? What about what I'm doing in the world or what I'm accomplishing or setting out to do? It was never really an individualized focus on any of us individually. Right. I don't feel this is my personal story, my personal experience. So if this is pissing anybody off, then that's on you. But this is how I personally feel. I agree. And it wasn't until I moved away to New York, I came back, I went to New York, had so much fun, and I got a taste of independence. And I came back and I was like, ah, this isn't this isn't working. Right. So I went away again. And I've, I've not that I've never looked back, like I would love to have the impact that I've had here back home but you wouldn't have been able to without this experience right but i I just think that but that's got to be hard right because you're like oh i miss you and i wish you were around but this is for the best right i mean that's parenting in a nutshell right your kids you raise them they grow up they do their thing and then they have their own family and you want the best for them and they don't always loop you into that that next phase of their life and i i understand that feeling more than your daddy does because your daddy has we only have one grandson and my husband is very much into hunting and fishing and you know crabbing and catfishing and catching alligators and that kind of stuff and he wants graham to do it with him but graham is all baseball because garrett was all baseball dad buys all the stuff he has one grandson he's only got one grandson and he well in his in his mind that's what boys do that's not what girls do. Girls do dancing and cooking and that kind of stuff. Okay. He's very misogynistic. Sexist. Okay. Sexist. He's very sexist. Um, so he's very sexist. The other, the last time Ruby was in New Orleans, I showed her Graham's first fishing pole when he was two. Okay. We still have ever, we don't throw anything away. And so we still had it. So she wanted to go catch an alligator. So he took her out in the front yard and taught her how to cast across the street, how he did with Graham. So if the girls were there, he wouldn't be so much about Graham. He would be more with Ruby. And Yeah, sure. Maybe. I don't know. And, I, and I've witnessed this where you, growing up, you worked your ass off. You did everything. You worked before care, after care, school. You did summer camp. You did summer school. You, you, did, you always getting more credentials to, uh, for your career. And then you did all the house stuff. And, and you, you say this all the time. Your life revolved around us. Yeah. And everything was about us. I did not I'm not replicating that like I think my children are one facet one amazing facet of my life but it's not the end all be all and I also don't think I am their end all be all my job is to raise good kids good people that are going to grow up and have a fulfilling life. And it doesn't necessarily mean that I'm going to be in it. It's not, doesn't necessarily mean that they're going to be in my life for the rest. You know what I'm saying? It's just like my life doesn't revolve around them. I have other things that are happening in my world so that when they do grow up and they get married, they might move away. Right. It's not going to be the end of my world. It's not going to, I might have other things going on. And I think that that's why I do sort of, have all my irons in the fire and I'm constantly working on all sorts of things because I want to live a long fulfilling life not just like one season of like that struggle that stress that oh let's get to this point you know what I'm saying because I think growing up too you feel like okay well when I get again from the south okay well when I graduate from college I'm going to be happy or when I when I get married I'm going to be okay then when I have kids I'm going to be okay and it's just like it's not healthy to feel like that all the time like you're just like constantly looking for the next thing or like I just want to be happy today 
Well, we always thought if once you retired, you, you'd you have it all. I retired, and it was like, okay, now what am I going to do? I have nothing to do every day. I have no money really extra to spend to just go throw away or whatever. All my friends are still working, or they have other things going on. So, I mean, I would watch TV all day. I was like, this, this is not me. This is not what I want to do. This is... I'm I'm bored. I'm about ready to go crazy. So you went back to work. So I went back to work. So this this episode will air on or around Mother's Day, and we have a lot of mothers that are listening. What advice would you have for them, or wisdom that you wanna be happy with what you're doing? Be happy with you and portray that into your kids. How do you how do you not take yourself so seriously? I always think like a child. <laughs> Don't put so much emphasis on the end result. Your end result is going to be different from my end result. Mm -hmm. And just accept it. Yeah, like have fun. Yeah, if it's not fun, don't do it. I agree. Well, thank you for being here, Mom. You're welcome. I love you. I love you. I love you! And I'm very proud of you. You always told me I love you. Dad, not so much. Well, your dad does say it now at at the end of every phone call. Because I trained him. Which is really scary. (laughs) Like, what happened to my husband? (laughs) This is not the man I married. This week's Saratoga Living After Hours. I am so excited because they announced, we already knew that Belmont was coming to Saratoga Springs and we were speculating that they would close down Broadway and there would be some really cool events happening around uh, around the race and it's official they are closing down Broadway but not where you think like I think when people say like oh they're closing down Broadway they're like oh my god they're gonna close down all of Broadway and they're not doing that they're just closing it down from the city center to Van Dam, so like North Broadway ish before you get to North Broadway the most exciting part of all of this is that Blues Traveler is going to be performing which is sort of like a throwback because Honestly, I'm pretty sure that Blues Traveler performed at my college. And so I'm super excited about this. Also, I am hearing rumblings of locals who are like, oh, I'm going to steer clear of Broadway. I'm going to steer clear of downtown because Belmont's going to be crazy. There's going to be hundreds of thousands of people. And I think that is just ridiculous. Like, you should absolutely come downtown. You should enjoy the festivities that the Chamber, the Convention Tourism Bureau, Downtown Business Association, they've all come together to put on this epic event I can't wait I am so excited and I am not going to Belmont just so everyone knows I wasn't able to score those tickets but I certainly will be around downtown just taking in all the things another big thing they're gonna do which they usually again do during opening weekend of our real track season is they're gonna do a window contest for downtown businesses so All you downtown businesses should definitely participate. I don't know what you win. I think you just win being able to call yourself the winner, which is awesome. So hopefully we will see you. It's the weekend of June 7th, June 7th, 8th, 9th, that whole weekend. Um, But the parties and the festivities and all the happenings are starting that Thursday night. So arrange your schedules to be here or be missing out. That's all I have to say about that. Thank you for listening to this podcast. And if you want to connect with me, slide into my DMs on Instagram. My handle is Katherine Hover.